Okay, now let's move on to talk about a few examples. Now let's use the radio basis function as our, as our uh, uh, driving engine and then to look at a, a few uh, useful things, uh, how we can do it in the, just predicting uh, some values on the curve. Okay, so imagine that you have a data set that has uh, some x values and then some y values. Uh, I want to find a function that can fit uh, all these data points. Okay, now, now you may imagine, okay, I can, first of all, I want to pick a polynomial and then I want to calculate the regression coefficients. I want to fit that. Now, uh, the polynomial is a global approach, and now I ask, can we go to the kernel method and do some localized uh, um, prediction? Hopefully, for this particular problem, that you can you can capture this nonlinear behavior. Right, there's a sharp edge in this data set. Okay, see if this uh, um, kernel method can help us tackle this issue. So um, the idea is, as I said, uh, we are going to use a thing called the radio basis function. Okay. Uh, now in this radio basis function, I need to define a few things. What would be the x, and then what would be the y's, and then how, how can I define this kernel? Right, a few things I need to define it first, and then I want to see if uh, all these definitions will fit into my problem. Then I run the algorithm. Okay, so now if you go to this uh, uh, problem, okay, one slide back, uh, you realize that um, uh, uh, these data points, they can be represented as two axes. This is called the t-axis, okay, time. Let me just call it time. Uh, and here, that would be your y-axis, okay, that would be the value axis. Uh, the input, your x, I will just define it as your t, okay? So every, uh, uh, on, on, on the t axis, there are a bunch of data points. So this is t1, this is t2, this is t3. These are your t's, okay? Uh, so the xn's are simply just the, the, the tn's. And then here, of course, you will have the yn's. Now, uh, what would be the kernel? Well, the kernel has to take the following form. The kernel has to take inputs from your x, space, okay, and in this case, the x will be, will be, will be your, your time stamps. So my kernel has to take the two time stamps, and then I have to give you a distance. If I choose the radio basis function, the distance will be given by this exponential of minus of the square distance between all these two time stamps, scaled by this two sigma square, the, the, the standard deviation between the two data points that I want, okay. Of course, sigma is something that you choose. Okay, so now I have defined this kernel, and uh, accordingly, I can also define the kernel matrix. The kernel matrix is nothing but a matrix K where the ijth element is exactly this quantity, okay, the exponential between the ith timestamp and then the jth timestamp. I put them together, then you can calculate this kernel matrix. Do they all one by one, then you can get that matrix. Now, for this problem, I can show you that the kernel matrix looks like this. I just plot the matrix uh, on, on my computer. And it looks like this, does it make sense? It kind of makes sense because the x-axis is actually the timestamps, and I'm now I'm measuring the distance from the timestamps point of view. If I'm here, uh, then I only want to take into account of the timestamps that are within my neighborhood. Okay, it would be a little bit further to the left, a little bit further to the right, that would be the, the timestamps I want to embrace, okay? And outside, because of the choice of sigma, they would become zero anyway, okay? So that would be the, 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 the shape of your kernel matrix. It has this banded diagonal uh, shape of this particular choice of kernel. If you choose a different kernel, it's a different story, okay? So uh, you have this kernel now, then what? Well, then you calculate this inverse. You have the y's. Y would be the values here. Okay, so in the previous slide, these values are there, the y's. You have the y's, you have the k's, you plug in a lambda, you get the alphas, and then you get the solution. Okay, you get all, you get the theta. Then what? Well, then you can do a prediction using this model. The prediction says that if a new sample comes, uh, by new sample, I really mean you want to evaluate 
your function at the new time stamps that are not in your training set. Okay, it's like an interpolation problem where you have uh, a, a set of data points, a finite, a finite set of data points where you have values, and then now you want to predict a value where the timestamp is not inside training set. So you have a new time standpoint comes in, you calculate the kernel, you calculate the distance, and then you make this kind of linear combination and you get a solution. Okay, look at this picture. The picture actually means that it can explain a lot of things I'm describing. Uh, all these crosses, they are the available points in your training set. They are given to you already. And then you choose a kernel that will create the red curves. Okay, the solid red curves, they're the kernels that you're choosing. And then um, by, by looking, by forming the linear combination of all these red curves, you get the red dotted lines. They are the imaginary virtual service that you are constructing using your kernel. When a new data point comes, you are using the, you're using this virtual dotted line to make a prediction. All right, how do you do that? You take the two kernels that are nearby and then interpolate using this linear combination because that way will tell you how much emphasis you want to put on to this point and how much emphasis you want to put on to that point where you have the values, okay? So you are literally interpolating data points using the available points and this is how the kernel method works. Um, <clears throat> so then you may ask, okay, what if I make the sigma bigger or smaller? And here is the outcome of your result. If you make the sigma extremely big, that means you're going to, to use a lot of your neighbors, okay? And if once you use a lot of your neighbors, then you're going to over smooth uh, your, your prediction, okay? And that would be the, the behavior, okay? If you see the picture on the left, you see that they, you, you, you do get a prediction, you do get a red curve, but that curve, red curve will be over smoothed. Versus if you choose extremely small sigma, then you will go to the right hand side, okay? You're just using one or two neighbors, then basically just rely him or her. That's all you need, okay? Then you will get extremely noisy prediction. So this kernel method can actually be used for what? For denoising uh, things that people have been doing for at least 15 years ago in image denoising literature that this is a very popular method, at least for, 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 for 10 years. So uh, <clears throat> you ask, can we do uh, some improvements on, 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 on this? Well, um, you, why should we restrict ourselves to a local neighborhood? Can we also include uh, the kernel uh, using, using, using the values Y here? Yeah, if you do that, uh, then you will just be a little bit more adaptive to your edge, okay? So uh, this is called the edge-aware or adaptive kernel by putting additional terms of the y's. If you have these two values, okay, so if you're here and then your neighbor includes this point here, then the y will be extremely big, okay? The y distance will be very big. So, so you will have a small, smaller uh, 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 kernel value. Uh, if you don't have that, well, then, then you just take into account of everyone so you will get a smooth edge. So this concept of edge aware of a kernel can also be applied. And if you apply that, uh, you will see the following result. Without, you will still have some good result. But if you use it, you will have even better result because now you can capture the, the sharp edge uh, using the, 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 the Y values, okay? All right, so um, two more slides. Uh, this slide shows you how this entire uh, thing works uh, in, in the, in, 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 by projecting a low dimensional space into a high dimensional space. Imagine that you have data points that are distributed according to this, uh, this two, two spirals, okay? And then now once you do this nonlinear transformation or if you employ the kernel method, essentially what you're doing is that you're turning this two-dimensional perspective into a three-dimensional perspective. So suddenly in this, in this space, it is not very easily separable, but once you lift uh, according to a nonlinear transformation, you can turn this problem into here and you can easily separate them using a, a simple uh, plane, okay? So how can you do that? Well, that's also uh, related to the kernel method that we are talking about. Um, 
Of course, uh, many of you have seen the kernel method for support vector machine. Uh, this is just one slide summarizing what you would normally do in a support vector machine uh, scenario where you have data points, you want to classify them between two classes, um, then you apply this radial basis transform to each data point, and then you draw a local neighborhood and then do some smoothing, that would be the decision boundary, okay? Of course, you need to choose the parameter properly in order to get a reasonable uh, decision boundary. Okay, so I hope this lecture have, you give, have given you some ideas of what I mean by kernel method. How can I use an extremely simple linear method and then just equip it with a very simple idea called a kernel method? Then I can suddenly do a bunch of nonlinear problems. All right, so here is a list of um, papers and textbooks, uh, chapters that you are encouraged to take a look. Um, the bottom two are two uh, are pretty useful things if you are doing an image processing or computer vision that is based on this idea of kernel regression, okay? Um, the books and then also the lecture slides from other schools are here, and they are also pretty um, are useful to read, okay? All right, so let's dismiss here, and then I will see you um, uh, in lecture four.